Good morning, Crossroads family. How are we doing this morning? Okay, okay. A couple of you guys are awake this morning. Well, we have yet another baptism this morning. So it's a little exciting, right? We've had a lot of baptisms here lately. So let's direct our attention over to the baptistry. It's okay, nobody's watching. No, so this is Elijah Gold. You will recognize the last name because in the last two months, three months, we baptized dad and then we baptized the wife, right? Not dad. Not, not dad. Okay, sorry, just kidding. We're working on dad. Dad's a process. Today, we'll talk about it. But God is moving through this family in an amazing way. And today, Elijah has decided that he wants to step out with his Christian community and just proclaim that this is the life that he wants to live. So join me in this. All right, dude, you ready? Yeah. All right, cool. I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died to save you from death? Yes. Awesome. Lastly, will you love and serve him for the rest of your life? Yes. Awesome. Elijah, now that you have professed your faith in Jesus and your love and willingness to serve him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can go ahead and plug your nose. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, dude. Good job. All right, church, will you stand up and let's worship God this morning. Coming on the cloud. Coming on the cloud. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. As broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion. The lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, His love breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free for who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing that out this morning. Who 
can stop the Lord Almighty. No one cares. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free.
Um, at this time, we would like to release the ushers to go back. Um, we're going to do communion at the beginning of service this morning. So we'd like to ask that you take the next few moments to reflect on the sacrifice of Christ. On that night, so long ago, Jesus, with his disciples, his closest friends, was pre preparing them for, about to, for what was about to happen. And he took a loaf of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body about to be broken for you. Take and eat. And like it, he took a glass of wine and said, this is my blood about to be shed for many. 
take and drink. Let's pray. Father God, we just are so incredibly thankful for the sacrifice that you made with your son, Jesus. We ask that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, for the message that Adam will bring to us. Bless Adam that he will speak your words. We just thank you and praise you so much for all that you are and all that you do for us. And we ask you to bless this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Good. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. If you're new here, my name is Adam. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. Super excited to be here today. I have tremendous news. I have officially passed my kidney stone from last week. It was gross. Let me tell you all the details. I'm just kidding. Uh, but thank you guys for your prayers. I feel like right after church on Sunday, I felt, I could feel your prayers. I know it's not as weird as that sounds. Like I could feel my body getting better and feeling better. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, they mean so, so much. Um, just a couple things real quickly. Uh, we have our kids event coming up May 21st called the uh, Clown Around. Make sure you bring your kids to that. If you want more information, you can go to our website or you can go to Connection Corner and find out more information. If you're here first time, you're new, make sure you stop by Connection Corner, fill out a Connect card because we want to get to know you. We want to connect with you. We, it's great that if you come in and sit and enjoy but we wanna get you plugged in. We wanna take you a step further because we believe when you take that step further and getting into community, getting into serving, uh, we believe that you are living out God's plan, God's best for your life. And then lastly, real quickly, next week, um, I'm gonna be preaching on a very, 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 very sensitive topic that a year ago when I had planned on preaching on it, I had no idea what would be happening in our country concerning Roe versus Wade. And so next week, I'm gonna be preaching uh, on abortion. I don't wanna talk about this. As I've been writing it and uh, going through it, it's not, it's not fun, <laughs> but we have to talk about it. Uh, just real quickly, one stat that I've learned uh, about abortion is that most abortions, uh, two-thirds of abortions uh, are happening through people who claim Jesus as Savior. So this is not a, a world problem. This is a church problem. This is a church issue. And so next week, I'm going to stand up here, probably not make a lot of friends, but I'm going to preach what the Lord has uh, put in his word concerning this issue. And it's a massive, massive, massive issue because an abortion is not, <laughs> it's not a simple procedure. It's not like a, another procedure where you go in and have a colonoscopy. You know, most our culture wants to talk about how abortion is just this, another procedure. And so we'll get into it next week. I'm ready to preach about it today, but uh, we're going to wait till next week. So just know, first of all, uh, please trust our hearts. Trust my heart and know that if you're here and you've had an abortion, we love you. We accept you. We, be, we believe that God's grace covers all sins, okay? And so we want to we wanna have this conversation next week. So I hope that you'll join us next week as we talk about the very, very tough question of abortion. Today, I'm going to be talking about what does biblical manhood look like? What does biblical manhood look like? So if you have your notes, open them up. If you have your notes on your phone, open them up. I want you to take notes today. If you're a man in this room, raise your hand. Okay, good. This message applies to you. If you're a woman in here today, raise your hand. 
Awesome, this applies to you as well. I'm gonna be talking about biblical manhood and why women will want to pursue and marry a man who is pursuing Jesus. And so I just want you to know from the front end that this is not gonna be one of those guide talks where I stand up here and just beat dudes down over the head. Like, you're not doing enough for your family, and you're a boy, and you're a child, and you got, that's not, the church has done that for years, and it's not working. It's clearly not working. And so if you're here today, and maybe you're a little nervous, if you're watching online, and you're a little nervous, like, oh man, here it comes. You know, like, he's gonna beat us over the head. I'm being a terrible father. I'm being a terrible husband. Maybe you are, but that's not what I'm trying to say today. And so we're gonna talk about this. And I sincerely believe, I sincerely believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be the man of God that he's called you to be throughout scripture. And so we're gonna look at scripture and we're gonna talk about biblical manhood. With that being said, what does, how does America view manhood? How do they view what being a man is? Is it the guy at the party in college who can do the most keg stands, you know, and he can chug the most beer and then puke his guts out later? Is that really what being a man is? Is being a man the guy who can go to a party and pick up any uh, lady that he wants? Is that what being a man is in our society? Is being a man the guy who knows every single caliber of gun and every shot size and, and how to skin a, a buck and run a trot line too? Like, is that, is that being a man? Is that being a man? Is it being a man if you can bench press 350 pounds? but you disrespect your wife, you're not there for your kids. What is a man? Is being a man just being passive, letting your wife decide, make all the decisions, putting all the pressure on her? You come home from work, you kick your feet up, watch TV, don't pay attention to your kids. Is that what being a man is? Is being a man coming to church, having your shirt tucked in, making sure you're prim and proper? Is that what being a man is? Let's look at what being a man is today. And I'll be honest with you, with you, this is something that I wish I would have learned when I was in middle school, when I was in high school. I wish my youth pastor would have had a conversation with our youth group about what does it mean to be a man? What does it, what does it look like? Because in youth group, mostly what we did was play silly games and, and talk about how God has a plan for your life. And then he would say, don't touch your girlfriend. Don't touch yourself. That's about it. And that's what youth group was. And so as a young man who did not have a godly male figure in his life as a father, I didn't know what it was. And the young girls, how did they know what to look for in a man? if they were never taught what it is. And so that's, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. As someone who did not grow up with a biblical man in my home and in my family, this is very near and dear to my heart. And so today we're gonna talk about biblical manhood and why women <laughs> will wanna marry someone who's pursuing it. And before we begin, let me, let me just say a quick prayer. Father. Thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to stand up here today, healthy and whole. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us and amongst us. God, we love you, and God, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, when I was in college, when I was in college, uh, I think it was my junior year, uh, I had an old F-150, and this old white F-150 used to get me into a lot of trouble. It was never my fault, it was always the truck's fault. And this one time, the truck decided that it wanted to turn a little bit quicker and hit uh, a, a, a professor's car at my college. And I was like, truck, why did you do that? So, uh, <laughs> so I left, I had no idea it was a professor's car. And you know, the sinful side of me was just like, hey, let's just let this go, she's rich, it's fine. She's a professor, she's got all my money anyways. So um, I left a note on the car. I left a note on the car, and <laughs> I remember I got a phone call from her husband. And he was a pastor, local pastor in the town, and this dude was all over me. I think I was, I don't know, 20 years old, and my insurance was through my dad. 
okay? And so I said, hey, man, I will contact my dad, and I'll try to set this up. And my dad's not always quick to move on things. And so about two weeks later, this pastor uh, person called me and just ripped me up ripped me up saying, you need to be a man, you need to take care of your business, get on this, blah, 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 a couple expletives, and then hung up the phone. And I remember in that moment just being like, yeah, I'm done with God, I'm done with Jesus, I'm done with all this stuff, because if that's how Christians are supposed to act, that's not what I'm about. And so I want to share again, today is not a day where we're trying to beat men down, but we want to build men up. And we live in this, we live in this culture, and all, everybody can relate to this. Everybody knows that this is probably true, that we live in an age where there's an extended adolescence. Extended adolescence. I read one article that said 25 is the new 18. And this is not me knocking on guys or knocking on young people, but 25 is the new 18. So decisions that you were making at 18, 20, 30 years ago is what 25-year-olds are making now. We're seeing 25 and above stay at home longer and longer and longer. We're seeing middle, uh, mid-20s and upper age men staying at home, not working, not pursuing relationships. In Japan, in Japan, uh, we're seeing males over the age of 40 who have never, had a, have never had a relationship with a real female. Their relationships are all online with a computer screen. And so, in our society today, we are seeing a lack of responsibility for men. Let's just talk about men this morning. We're seeing a delayed and extended adolescence and less responsibility put on people. And let me just say this. A lack of responsibility does not make for very strong Christians. A lack of responsibility does not make for very strong men. If we allow our sons to continue to live in Peter Pan Neverland, they will continue to live in Neverland. And so we have a lot of men in our society today who are stuck in Neverland. They're stuck in never growing up. And they have no responsibility. And it does not make for strong Christians. And so what is biblical manhood? What does biblical manhood look like? I believe our best picture of masculinity and manhood is found in the person of Jesus. The most manly man in all of history is Jesus. And we're going to look at five different reasons on why that is true. What did Jesus do to make him the picture of manhood? Number one is this. I want you to write this down. The number one thing he did is Jesus took responsibility. He took responsibility for you. He took responsibility for me. He took responsibility for the weight of the world, for the sins of the world. He said, this is not my sin. This is really not my problem. This isn't something that I've done, but I'm gonna take responsibility for my kids. I I brought them here, and I am going to be there for them. Jesus is the essence of masculinity because he took responsibility responsibility. And let me ask you, gentlemen in here this morning, are you taking responsibility, number one, for yourself? If you're here today and you're single and you don't have a wife, you're not engaged, are you taking responsibility for yourself? In your marriages, are you taking responsibility for yourself? Oh, I can't get in shape because my wife doesn't cook good. Or my wife does this, or my wife does that, and all my problems. Are you taking responsibility for you? Are you taking responsibility for yourself in your finances, particularly for younger men in here this morning? Do you have a plan for your future? Do you have a plan for your finances? Men, do you have a plan for your finances? Ladies, this is for free. You can write this down. Ladies, never plan a future with someone who has no future plan for himself. 
That's pretty good. Let's do it again. Never plan a future with someone who has no future plans for themselves. Whoo, someone should have said that to my family. Anyways, um, priest, come on now. Do you have a plan for your finances? Are you giving? Are you giving to God? Are you giving to others? Are you spending money needlessly and, and, and accruing debt that, that is irresponsible? Do you, have, do you own your own spiritual life? Are you responsible for feeding yourself? Because if you're depending on a sermon on Sunday to last you through the week to the next Sunday, it's not gonna be good enough. It's not gonna be good enough. Are you taking responsibility for your own spiritual life? Where you take the spoon, you dip it into the food, you dip it into the scriptures, you're on your knees praying for your family, and you're eating it, and you're feeding yourself. Because a biblical man is feeding himself spiritually. He's not relying on his parents' principles, on his family's principles, on his family's history of following Jesus. He owns it for himself. The second thing that is this, for being responsible. You're responsible for yourself, but also responsible for your spouse. As a man, you are responsible for your spouse. In Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, God is calling out to Adam and Eve after they fell. It says this in Genesis 3, 8 through 10. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He said, where are you? It says he called to the man, where are you? And he answered, and, and Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. They sinned, they, 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 they disobeyed God, and they discovered that they were naked, and they felt incredible shame. And even though it was Eve's sin, God is walking in the garden calling out for Adam. He's calling out for the man. Because what happened was, is the serpent was there with Eve, tempting Eve, and the scripture says that she ate and then gave some to her husband who was standing there with her. He was standing right next to her when the serpent was tempting her with the fruit. What was Adam doing in that moment? He was not taking responsibility for himself or his wife. What he should have done is kick that snake in the face. He should, have, he should have took a knife and cut that thing's head off and said, get out of here. You are not going to disrupt my family. You are not going to poison my family. And guys, we have some of us who are doing the exact same thing Adam did thousands and thousands of years ago. We're allowing snakes into our family. We're allowing sinful things into our family, whether it's through television, the internet, friends, whatever it is, we are allowing things into our family where we should be cutting its head off before it ever steps foot into our home. What are we doing? And men, it is your responsibility along with your wife, to be navigating and looking at what are these things? What are my kids into? What is happening? What are the, what are the potential dangers that are, that are trying to come into my heart? What are the potential dangers that are trying to steal my kids and my wife? You know, the, the Bible says that, that Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And that means the same for your family. Satan is not your buddy. He's not some cuddly, you know, cuddly uh, evil guy over in the corner. No, he is an assassin who wants to assassinate you and your family. He hates you to your core because you are made in the image of God. But guess what? You have Jesus, God, Yahweh on your side. That through him all things are possible. So we have to pay attention to what's happening in our family. Men, please stop coming home and just sitting on the couch and flipping up the, 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 your seat and just watching sports all night while your kids are drowning, your wife is drowning. They need a dad. Our world needs dads desperately, desperately. 
I think most of the issues that we have in our society are because of men not being men. We have so many, so many guys who are just boys that can shave. They're 40 some years old, it's a full beer, drinking their craft beer, and they don't acknowledge their family, they don't, they're not there for their kids, they're spending money needlessly, and they're not planning for the future. Adam was held accountable for Eve. Eve was held accountable for her own sin. Be sure of that. Ladies, you're not off the hook and be, because your husband's not calling you out on stuff, okay? This is not a license to sin and blame it on your hubby, okay? But Adam was the head of the family. He, he's, he's like the CEO. He's like the, he's like the head coach. This hurts me painfully, but I have to use it as an illustration to help bring this around. He's like Coach Ryan Day, okay? There's Coach Ryan Day. You don't have to clap, you don't have to clap. There's Coach Ryan Day and there's C.J. Stroud, okay? Now, C.J. Stroud might be throwing the ball. He might be the one throwing interceptions. And when he comes back to the sideline and the game is over, people aren't yelling and screaming at C.J. Stroud. They're yelling and blaming Ryan Day. And why are they blaming Ryan Day? Because Ryan Day is the head coach. He's the, he's, he's the top of the organization. Everything below him, he's responsible for. Now, CJ and all that, you know, the cold weather, I know it's tough, but, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, CJ's held accountable, but ultimately, Ryan Day, his butt is on the line when things don't go well. And the same is true for your family, guys. Like when you stand before Christ someday, he's gonna ask you, what'd you do with my son? How did you, you know, did you share Jesus with others? And how were you with your family? Did you lead your wife? You know, the Bible says that she should be well watered. She should be well watered, covered with scripture. How are you doing with that? In 1 Corinthians, like we talked about last week, 1 Corinthians eleven three says this, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And so there should be mutual submission between man and woman. However, ultimately, at the end of the day, man is gonna have to have an account for how he led his family. And if you're here today, and you don't have a spouse, you don't have a girlfriend, start by taking responsibility for yourself. Take responsibility for yourself. The essence of masculinity is taking responsibility. The essence of masculinity is taking responsibility. I don't care how many beers you can chug, I don't care how many deer you can kill with your bow, I don't care how good your golf game is, the essence of masculinity is taking responsibility. You may be in here and you can't bench press 150 pounds, but sir, if you take care of your family, if you show up every single day, you're praying with your kids, you're praying with your wife, you're providing a life for them, you are a biblical man. I don't care what all the other manly things that you can do. If you are taking responsibility for your family, you are a man. And so my question for you right now is, which guy do you wanna be? Do you wanna be the guy that always comes through? Do you wanna be the guy that people know, if I call him, he is gonna come through? Because I know that this guy is responsible. He's responsible for himself, he's responsible for his family, he's responsible for those in the community around him. He is a guy who will take responsibility even when nobody's asking. Guys, do you wanna be that guy? Or do you wanna be the guy that people are like, oh, we could call him, but he's just so flaky. He says he'll hook commit, but he just, he just flakes out. Do you wanna be that guy? The guy that nobody wants to depend on? Because I think in the heart of every man, we wanna be the guy that people call on. We wanna be the superhero. We wanna we want come through for people when they need us the most. And that starts by taking responsibility for yourself, for your family, and the people around you. The second thing is this, I want you to write this down. Biblical manhood that we see in Jesus is that Jesus was, all, was tough, 
and we see that Jesus was tender. Jesus was tough, and he was tender. I want you to think about it like a sponge. You see this? Men, have you ever seen a sponge before? This is what you use to clean dishes, you know. So on a sponge, there's a soft side. Every man needs to, every man needs to be a sponge. You need to be a sponge. There's the soft side, and you can use that on fine china, I don't know, stuff. I don't do a lot of, we have a dishwasher, so I just throw it all in. <laughs> but seriously, you have a sponge, okay? And you got the soft side. It takes care of the softer things. It's more gentle. But then the sponge also has a rough side, a tough side to get away at those things that are a little bit tougher, the things that, that the soft side just won't work for. There's some things that being soft will not work for, will not work. Being tender will not work. There are some situations in life that are gonna call for you to be tough. And so men, we gotta be sponges. Men, we gotta be tough, and man, do we gotta be tender. When you look at Jesus, Jesus was tough and tender. Was he tough? Absolutely, look at Jesus. He took the 40 lash, lashes minus one. He took beating after beating. They ripped his beard out of his face. And the Bible says he was beaten beyond recognition. They, didn't even, they couldn't even physically tell that it was Jesus. And Jesus took a 200 pound cross and he carried that thing as far as he could to Calvary. Was Jesus tough? Absolutely. Was Jesus tough? He, he fashioned a whip because he was, in, he was in the temple and there was people selling stuff and they were making a mockery of his house and so Jesus fashioned a whip. Now you think about Jesus in all the you know, cuddly TV shows and they, they show him so, so cuddly and blonde and blue hair and it's like, have you ever done any research on what Middle Eastern people look like? And he, he, is, he is fashioning a whip and he takes this whip and he whips the Pharisees out of there. He speaks to Pharisees directly. These men who could take his life. And he speaks to them directly, telling them why they are wrong and what they should be doing. Was Jesus tough? Absolutely Jesus was tough. Absolutely he was tough. But Jesus was also tender. He was so tender. You can think of the time when, when Jesus was surrounded by children and they're sitting on his lap and he's loving on them and he's hugging them and I'm sure he's giving them high fives. I don't know if they did high fives 2,000 years ago, but he's doing the equivalent of high fives and, and he brings these children to him and the disciples are trying to kick the kids away because back in that time, you just kick kids, you know? Like, can't do that now in public. But, you know, you just, <laughs> like, you know, people would just kick kids and kids had no uh, value and <laughs> Jesus brings value to these little ones. You know, you think about Jesus at the, at the well with this Samaritan woman, and he could have just crushed her. And he's so tender, and he shares love. Was Jesus tough? Absolutely. But Jesus was also tender. Gentlemen, we have to be tough when circumstances call us to be tough. But we can't always be tough. If we're always tough, then it will be hard to let people in. And we can't always be tender. You can't always be tender. Because if you're always tender, people are going to walk all over you. And your family's not going to feel safe. You need to be a controlled warrior. Ready to go. What's that saying? Better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war? That's who you need to be. You need to be a sponge. I remember when Kirsten and I were engaged. We were, we were in... Uh, Libertyville, Illinois, in Chicago, the Chicago area. And I remember, this is so silly. I, I, I'm gonna tell you a story, I guess. So I remember we were watching Frozen. You guys know what Frozen is? Anybody know what Frozen? You, don't, you do? Yeah, okay, okay, cool. 13, girl, you should know. Um, and there's a song, what's the song? How's it go? Let it go, let it go. And I remember just like jamming to let it go. You know, I didn't care. I'm like, I'm singing to Frozen, blah, blah, blah. It was so amazing. And I was having this just very tender moment. 
with Kirsten. Just, just, you know, I was being whatever. And then we, later we went to a park. I'm not very proud of this next part. But we went to a park and, okay, so old Adam was just trying to be tough all the time. I'm not saying I was tough, but I was trying to be tough all the time. So I do have that side in me that can just be like, ah. So uh, I control it. And um, so I remember we're talking and we're having this sweet conversation about how we, you know, we love each other and nobody's ever loved. Like Kirsten and I have loved. We're the best couple ever. Our friends suck because we are so good. And so we've done all that stuff. And then this dude and his buddy, like these little dudes, thug dudes, I don't know what they were. Anyway, so they're walking at us, and this one dude had a broken arm, okay? And he's lucky he had a broken arm. So anyways, he had a broken arm, and he is walking, and like we're sitting here, and he like looks at Kirsten, up, down, up, down, looks at me like, what you gonna do about it? And kept walking, and I hate to say this, I blew up out of that chair and I started aggressively walking towards him. And he like looked at me like, oh geez, what's this guy gonna do? And Kirsten is literally grabbing me, like no, 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 don't do it, don't do it. I'm like, I'm gonna break his other arm, I'm gonna get him right now, geez, OP, you can't look at my, my woman, this is my woman, man, don't you look. And I am just barking at this dude and he's just like, oh my gosh. Here's the deal, you gotta be tough <laughs> and you gotta be tender and be tough in the appropriate moments, okay? Be tough in the appropriate moments. Have a righteous anger about the sin in the world. Be tough on what is happening in our world. Be tough on the injustices that we face in our community. Be tough on, the, on what's happening with our homeless, with our drug addicted. Be tough on ending world hunger. Be tough on fighting and bringing people to Jesus. Be tough in fighting against Satan and spiritual battles. You gotta be tough in protecting your family. You gotta be tough in protecting your own heart. Be tough. Be tough, but guys, also be tender. Be empathetic with those around you and be forgiving. The third thing is this. Jesus shows us a biblical man is a leader. A biblical man is a leader. If you're here today and you're a father, if you're a husband, if you're a grandfather, you are a leader. If you're a man in here today, you are a leader. Someone is looking up to you. I don't care if you're 13 or 43 or 83, someone is looking up to you. And as a biblical man, God wants you. God wants you to be a leader. And so start by leading yourself. Start by leading yourself. Don't just rely on Sundays, like I said before. We have a men's group that meets on Saturday mornings uh, at Capuanas. They would love to have you. If you want more information, you can contact me, go to Connection Corner. We would love to have you at our men's gathering. You know, there's a, a verse in 1 Corinthians 14 that says men should be able to teach. If their wife has a question, if their wife has a Bible question, that they should go home and ask their husband the question, and the husband is supposed to have the answer. I wonder how many of us, when our wife would come to us about a Bible question, would feel confident enough to answer it because we've been in the Word so much, we've been studying, we've been drawn close to the Lord, but yeah, we can answer that. Vince Lombardi said this, a legendary coach, football coach, he said, leaders are not born. He said, leaders are made. And I think that's so true. Leaders are not born, leaders are made. One of the best leaders I've ever seen in my life was a 10-year-old boy on the south side of Chicago. And I'm telling you what, this young boy at 10 years old had more manhood in his thumb than most men have in their entire body. 
This young boy, uh, we went to Southside Chicago on a mission trip, uh, and we visited with a woman uh, named Miss Pearl. She has an orphanage. It's amazing. She's got this whole block. The, the, the gang leaders respect her. She watches the gang leader's kids. She is tough. There was a time when a team from my previous church went, and, and guys were out in the street shooting guns just to shoot guns up in the air, and she was like, hey, knock it off. And they're like, sorry, Miss Pearl. And they like went inside. She is tough. And she's raising some tough, tough, tough boys. And this 10-year-old, I was charged, I was charged to walk this 10-year-old boy home in the middle of the South Side Chicago. I am the only guy who looks like this. Okay? And I watched this little boy, he would, you know, we had to walk two other kids and I'd watch him and he would grab these other kids and he'd get their coats on, young, young kids, and he would help get their shoes on and he would tell them, like, this is what we gotta do and then he would tell me, you know, like, you know, Pastor Lynch, this is, we gotta go down this street and down this street. He's like, but don't worry, I got you. You don't have to worry about anything. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm like 27, 28, you know, I'm this big and he's like this big, but he's like, I got you. And this young man, this young man walked me and he, you know, his siblings and a few other kids throughout all the South Side of Chicago, five or six blocks, and he would like wave at people and you would not believe the respect that this young man drew from the gang leaders and other people in that community. Unbelievable. All because he had a servant's heart and all because he took responsibility for himself, his family, and the people around him. That kid is a leader. At 10 years old, I'm seeing him do more things than I'm seeing guys at 33 do. He's a man, he's a leader. If you're a guy in here this morning, you are a leader. Are you living up to that? Number four is this. We see in Jesus that Jesus was selfless. And a biblical man is selfless. A biblical man will, if he's living with his parents, he's gonna help them around the house. He's not just gonna have his own room and just tuck himself away and play his video games. I'm not against video games, but tuck himself away and let his parents pay for food, let his parents pay for rent, let his parents pay for his bills. That's not what biblical manhood is. A biblical man is taking care of his finances, saving for the future, giving, and not accruing foolish debt. A biblical man knows how to manage his time and he manages his time in a way that benefits his family but also benefits others. Because guys, as you know, who are married, once you get married and you have kids, you have your time for yourself gets less and less and less because you're responsible for more and more and more. And I believe that as godly men, we embrace this. We don't push away and, and wish we had our hobbies and wish we could only do our hobbies a biblical man takes responsibility and knows that his time is not always his own. So if you're a young guy in here now and you're not married, please, 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 please start learning this lesson now. To start sharing your time. To not think of your time as only as your own because God has given us all a certain amount of time on this planet and it's not meant for you and you alone. It's to better other people. You see, a lot of people think that being a man is getting whatever you want. What, I want this, I get this. That's what being a man is. I got my bank account, it's full, it's flush, I got great drip on. I think that's what the kids say for a cool shirt. I don't know. <laughs> but Jesus was a servant leader. Jesus was a servant leader. In Philippians 2, Jesus himself, it says that Jesus himself uh, he said Jesus himself became a servant. There's this, I'm gonna invite my friend up. Um, there's this part in the Gospels that I love. Let me take a drink. There's this part in the Gospels that I just love so much. Because when you think about a man, you know, you don't think about men being, you can put it right here. You don't think about men being submissive. Like when you think about the word submissive, you think of like, you know, it's not, a, it's not a friendly word in the guy realm. But there's a story in the Gospels where uh, Jesus, let's do it, let's do it. Go ahead, take your shoes off, please. 
There's this time in, this, in, in the scriptures in the New Testament where Jesus is uh, with his disciples and his time's about to come. You take your socks off too. Yeah. And, and Jesus, I mean, you gotta understand, these dudes walked around all day in sandals, walking through cow poop, walking through goat poop, walking through poop. Um, I'm just trying to get poop as much as I can. He walked through, I mean, they walked, their, their feet were gross. Gross. And in our society today, being a man is I get my way every day, and I don't have to lower myself to any standards. And what Jesus did is Jesus wanted to show and I just gotta tell you, I hate feet. I hate feet. Mine are nice and hairy for you. And they're hairy. He looks like a hobbit. Oh my gosh. Those are hobbit feet. What is this? What are they giving you at Cedarville? So, but Jesus, but Jesus says, I want you guys to sit down. I want you guys to sit down and I'm gonna wash your feet. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. No, 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 Lord, you are God. You are the son of, of God. How could you ever wash my feet? You're, you're above this. And Jesus shares with his disciples that to be a leader, to be a servant leader, you're not above anything. You'll clean toilets. I can't tell you how many seminary students that I've rejected <laughs> from having any type of internship or anything because they weren't humble enough to clean toilets first. If you can't clean toilets, you do not deserve to speak on that stage. You gotta be humble. And Jesus is showing them, this is what humility likes. This is what servanthood likes. And so Jesus is like, so Jesus gets down and he grabs Peter's feet and he starts washing his feet. And this is so gross and I hate it. <laughs> and he washes his feet, he gets in his toenails. How's that? You got the beard too. And so then he takes his other foot. You know, he's got to clean it because there's so much poop on there. And remember, this is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. This is the one who sits on the throne. This is the one where the angels sing 24 7 Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's who's doing this right now in Scripture. When Jesus is doing that, that's who's doing it. Jesus makes himself a servant and he washes all 12 disciples' feet and, feet and he cleans them and he washes them and he even cleans Judas' feet who's about to betray him where he's gonna be nailed to a cross. Thank you very much. And so he cleans his feet. He cleans his feet and after he's done, he says that's what, that's what being a leader is to get on your knees and do the stuff that nobody else will. You know, I'm gonna brag on Jesse a little bit right now. I knew Jesse was gonna do very, very well when he first came here. <laughs> I knew Jesse was gonna do very, very well when he first came here because we were walking through the hallway together and there was a piece of trash, just like a Starburst wrapper. We saw tons of people walk past it. And as we're walking, Jesse just bends down, picks it up, puts it in his pocket, and then later throws it away. That's a servant leader. Nobody saw that. Nobody would have cared, but he did it anyways, because he's a leader. And guys, so much about being a biblical man is not about getting your way. It's not about being the toughest and baddest. It's about taking responsibility and humbling yourself like Jesus did. The last thing is this, and this is a word, like I said, we don't like, is that a biblical man submits. He submits to God's call on his life. In Genesis 12, one through two, this guy named Abram, who would later be Abraham, who God said he would bless him into a great nation, says this, in Genesis 12, one through two. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go from, the country, from your country, your people and your father's household, to the land that I will show you. He says, go to the land I will show you. I haven't even showed it to you yet, but I want you to be faithful and I want you to go. And he says, I'm gonna make you into a great nation and I'm gonna bless you and I'll make you a great name and you'll be a blessing. He says, go, and Abram starts walking. 
Men, when God tells you to go, when God tells you to move, do you move? Do you submit to his will for your life? Maybe there's a habit that's just kind of just causing tension in your family. Is God saying, let it go? Let it go. It's breaking up you and it's breaking up your family. Let it go. It's not worth it. And this story with this story with, with Abraham goes even further. Not only did God ask him to go into this land that I will show you, God says, I know you're like 100 years old and, and you had your first kid. His wife Sarah was 98. Can you imagine being 98 and 100 having a kid? Woo! Is anybody, is anybody in their 90s? Can you raise your hand? 90s? No, but, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. And so God says, here's the deal. You're, you're 100, your wife's 98. I want you to take your son, Isaac, whom I promised you and promised that you would be a great nation and I want you to take him and I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to take a knife and plunge it into his chest. And what does Abraham do? He doesn't say, God, no, God, don't do this. Don't call me to do this. Don't blah, blah, blah. This is my first son. This is my only son. He says, okay, Lord. And so Isaac is carrying the wood and he's like, where's the, where's the lamb or where's the ram? And Abraham says, God's gonna provide. And eventually, if you know the story, God provides a ram caught in a thicket. But the point of the story is that Abraham was willing to do and drop and submit to anything that God asked. So my question for you is, are you willing to do the same thing? Are you willing to drop at, the, at a moment's notice that which, which God has asked you to drop, that the thing that's keeping you from growing closer to him, that's keeping you from being the man of God that he wants you to be, are you willing to let it go? Or do you have this attitude that, do you have this attitude that I can just do it myself? I can just bare knuckle, my, my, I can just white knuckle and, and, and do this on my own. I, I've had so many friends. I have a friend that played Division I football, and he thought he was the man. He was cocky and confident. But his parents had gotten divorced, and he was just absolutely devastated over his parents breaking up. And throughout college, he struggled with drinking, and he struggled with so many different things because he wasn't willing to submit his life and submit his hurt to his heavenly father. Now, finally, he got into some counseling, submitted his heart to the Lord, and he's doing a lot better now. But let me just say this, no one is too tough. No one is too tough for God. No one, <laughs> you are not so tough that you can handle this life alone. And so a after we've talked about these five things, how are you doing with being a biblical man? How are you doing with that? Do you take responsibility for your life, for your family, and those around you? Real quickly, I want to put, uh, talk about these three points. These are the top reasons why women should want to marry a man pursuing biblical manhood. If you are single in this room, if you're single watching online right now, please write this down. Number one, he's going to love you like Christ loves the church. The Bible says for men to love their wives as Christ loved the church. What does that mean? He, he's willing to die to himself for you and your family. He's gonna put God first. He's gonna put his family second. His hobbies will be secondary and you will become primary. He won't spend so much time pursuing an animal rather than your heart. He's not gonna spend so much time trying to figure out his fantasy football and he's gonna spend time trying to figure out how can I connect with my kids. You see, hobbies aren't a bad thing, but they can become a bad thing when they're not in the right order. The second thing is this. He will he, uh, the, a biblical man will take responsibility for himself and for you and your family. He's not gonna run out when things get tough. You know those guys, ladies, you know those guys who are, mis he's Mr. Good Time, as long as the money's flowing and happiness has happened, he's there. But at the first moment of trouble, he is gone. A biblical man won't do that. A biblical man sticks through it through thick or thin. When times get tough, he gets tougher. When times are hard, he goes to the Father. 
when you're struggling and he's hurting, he's there for you. He's the shoulder that you can cry on. And so which man do you wanna wake up to every single day? Do you wanna wake up next to the guy who, who is there only, he's only there for when things are a party? Or do you wanna wake up next to the guy who you know will never leave you or abandon you? The third thing is this. This is so important, and this is what scares so many guys. A Christian woman is, na- is uh, mutually submissive, yet strong in her convictions. I have met so many young adult men who are so scared of Christian women who know what they want, know the Bible, and they're gonna hold their fiance and their husband up to very high standards. A biblical woman should hold her husband to high standards. She has high ex- uh, expectations for the man, how he will lead her. She has high expectations on how he will model how to follow Jesus for her and her children. And he points them back to Jesus every day, pointing everything back to Christ. And she knows that she can be comforted when things are hard and things are tough. He will not leave. He will not forsake her. No matter what she faces, no matter what he faces, he will be back over and over and over. To the end of his life, he will never leave her and he will never forsake her. She knows that a biblical man will respect her, will respect her, her body, her thoughts, her opinion. And she knows that she can trust him with her inmost feelings and thoughts and struggles. And here's the deal. This is what separates the men from the boys. If you don't hear anything else, that I say this morning, this is what separates the men from the boys. A Christian godly woman will have high expectations for their man. And a biblical man wants those high expectations. He craves those high expectations. He wants those responsibilities. He wants that type of partnership. He wants a strong woman who can speak her mind and mutually submit to her husband as he mutually submits to her. A godly man wants that and takes that on with pride through the power of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we close this morning, if you're struggling with biblical manhood, I wanna give you four things real quickly. Number one is this, this is very practical, very practical. If you're struggling with becoming a biblical man and you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Simple as that. Give your life to Jesus today. We're gonna have people down front, elders down front, that would love to pray with you, talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus, talk about some steps after accepting Christ into your life. Baptism, we're gonna talk about those things. But if you're struggling, come up front. Do not miss the opportunity to pray with somebody. Nothing happens without prayer. The second thing is this, start thinking about your future and your exit strategy. Start thinking about your future financially, family. If you're a guy here and you're single, you don't have a family, start thinking about your exit strategy out of your parents' home. How am I gonna get out of this? Maybe you're in financial debt. Maybe you're in over your head. Start making a plan to get out of it. A man takes responsibility. Number three is get involved serving somewhere. We have so many men who are so passive and who just let women do everything in the church and do all the the inviting and all the discipling. Even in Jesus' time, he was surrounded by women who was doing so much work. And my question for us this morning as men, are you gonna sit by and be passive? I don't know if you've noticed the church is growing and the church is moving and God's doing it. And man, we need godly men to step up We need you to step up. God wants you to step up. Your wife wants you to step up. Your kids need you to step up. And number four is this, and this is something that has helped me so much in my life because I have never had a father that was a good male example in my life. And you know what? That's not an excuse. Because God, if you start praying about it, God will put men in your life that can help you, that will support you, that will help you move in the right direction. And so we have guys that will wanna do that and partner with you. You can do this. 
Men, you can do this. This is the life that God has for you. And God believes that you can do it. And as I close, as I close, the writer, Paul, in so many of his letters, he tells his people, he tells the men, I want you to love your wife like Christ loved the church. You wanna talk about responsibility, holy smokes. How did Christ love the church? He died for her. He died to himself. As he was in the garden, he was praying and he was praying sweat, or he was praying blood droplets. He's saying, Father, if there's any way out of this very tough situation, take me out of it. But ultimately, Jesus took responsibility for you and for me. And he loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And husbands, now's the time to start loving your wife like Christ loved the church. Start dying to yourself. Start dying to your wants and needs all the time. Don't let your hobbies separate you from your family and your wife. Don't let your addiction separate you from your family and your wife. Now's the time to start saying, God, I wanna die to my own needs, to my own desires. I wanna die because I am responsible for my wife and for my kids and my community around me. So God, purify me for my addictions. Take away my struggles, take away my selfishness. Help me to lead like a servant. Help me to lead like you, Jesus. Help me be, to be willing to die to myself every single day because there's gonna be times you're gonna go to work and it's gonna be so hard, guys. You're gonna go to work. I can't tell you, I have had so many conversations where throughout the day I've talked to people about, uh, 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 I've talked to people about abortion. I've talked about people at suicide. I've talked about all these things. It's so tough. And I just wanna come home and I just wanna zone out. But I sit in my truck I sit in my truck and I hold the steering wheel and I say, God, give me the strength. God, give me the strength to just go in there and play with my boys and play with my wife, or not play with my wife, but be in there. God, if, God, if you make it happen, I will do it. But God, give me the strength to, to, to love on my wife, to play with my boys, to give them all of me. We have so many men who are going to bed with so much energy, so much energy, because they spent all their time on themselves and on their wants and their dreams. And God's saying, I want you to go to bed just absolutely wrung out, so tired, where you, when your head hits the pillow, you are out because you are so wrung out for, for working hard for your family, for loving your wife, for loving your kids. And then you go to bed exhausted and you wake up doing it the, the next day, all for the glory of God, all for the glory of Jesus, all for building up your family. So guys, there is a high expectation on you. And I sympathize with you and I'm with you. And so let's do it. Let's just do it. Let's stop being passive and let's start being aggressive and loving and let's be tough and let's be tender because that is who God has created you to be. Ask for forgiveness. What are the things that you need to give up? What are the things that you need to say, no more? This is not allowed in my family. Like Adam should have cut the head off of that snake. What are the things that you need to start cutting off in your family? What are those things that, are, that, that has the potential to ruin your family? If there is a 90% chance that you're gonna drive out here in your car and get in an accident, you would do everything in your possibility, to, in your power to make sure that doesn't happen. And some of us are so, are so numb to what's happening in our family, that our families are consumed with media, consumed with everything that's not God, and they're on their way to hell. Husbands, fathers, men, you are responsible for your wives, you are responsible for your kids. Let's grow up and be men and leave Neverland and never go back. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for what you did through the power of the cross. God, I pray for men in here this morning. God, help us. God, help us to be strong in you. God, it is so hard. It is so hard to be a man sometimes. There's so much expectations, but God, we can do this through the power of your Holy Spirit. We can do this, God, if we just wake up 
every single day with open hands saying, God, you take it. God, you take this from me. Whatever my addictions, whatever my selfishness is, whatever my hobbies that are getting in the way of my family, God, take it away so I can be present for my family, so I can be present for you. God, help me to take responsibility. There might be some of us in this room right now that just has to, they have to confess. I, I'm not who I, I, God's called me to be. I've got addictions. I've got wants and desires. I've got secret sins that my wife doesn't know about. God, I pray that, we'll, that, that those men will come down front, ask for forgiveness. They'll come down front and get prayed for. I pray that they'll take advantage of our men's groups. God, I pray that you would make us a church where men are so on fire for God that the world will look and say, what is happening? These men are so tough, but they're so tender. God, make us into who you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Sing this out. He is jealous for me. His love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. How many believe that this morning? And he is jealous for me. His love's like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Come on, church. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. Drawn to redemption by the 
grace in his eyes if his grace is an ocean we're all sinking do you believe that this morning and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us just crying out to him this morning yes he Dear Lord, I'm so thankful for what we just sang and how true it is, Lord, that you love us beyond any kind of measure we could fulfill, any kind of reach we could fathom, Lord. Your love is so unbelievably profound for us, and we thank you so much for that. It's the saving grace. It's the love that compelled you to go to the cross. It's the love that compels you to keep pursuing us now, Lord, to being faithful to us now, Lord. So we praise you for that. We thank you for that. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, yeah, give it up for God. Amen. Yes. Well, thank you for being with us today. I've got two quick announcements real quick, and then we'll get you out the door. First of all, we do have students tonight. We're wrapping up our study in Ephesians with middle schoolers and high schoolers tonight at six o'clock. Lastly, this weekend, this Saturday from two to four, we have a children's event here on campus called the Schools Out Clown Around. Listen, Three ladies need to be recognized this morning. Ashley Berman, Lauren Fox, and my wife, Katie Wilson, have been pouring hours and hours and hours into this event. It is going to be exactly, yes. It is going to be so awesome. We have booths with carnival games. We're going to have clowns and all sorts, face painting, character artists. Please come out with your kids. Please come out and enjoy this event. We want to be a community with you outside of Sunday as well. Lastly, uh, giving is always at the end whenever you're walking out in the boxes. And like Adam spoke today, the call on men is incredibly high. Please, please don't do it alone. We are a church that wants to be for you. We're going to have some, some people down front here to pray with you. If you have questions, concerns, things you want to be supported in, please come down front. Let us support you in this. All right. We love you guys. Have an awesome, awesome Sunday.